What helps is bringing to the book uh, life experience. Um, you know, presumably um, Mozart was writing uh, concertos when he was four, and Jackson Pollock was sprinkling paint on the floor when he was two or three. But a writer needs to live a little bit. And I think the most important experience that I had was not my journalism undergraduate degree, but was uh, what happened afterwards. There are no prodigy writers. You have to have been around, and life experience, I think, counts for a lot more than knowing where to put commas. Although if you're in one of my courses and you put a comma before that, and not which, I'll flunk you. <laughs> John, you want to say anything, or shall we turn it back? I think we're ready to rock okay. and roll. This is John's got a really good uh, joke <laughs> for us over there. Oh, he does. No, this is why I took no. the last chair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a little bit about our panelists. Uh, most of you are pretty familiar with these folks. Uh, but Margaret Marin was born and raised in North Carolina. She published her first novel, One Coffee With, in 1981, and has subsequently published two dozen more and a short story collection. In 1992, her novel, Bootlegger's Daughter, won the Edgar Award, the Anthony Award, the McCavity Award, the Agatha Award, and just about every other award in the mystery uh, community. Uh, she is a past president of Mystery Writers of America and Sisters in Crime, as well as one of its founders. Jeffrey Deaver is the author of 22 novels and two collections of short stories and has been nominated for six Edgar Awards from the Mystery Writers of America, an Anthony Award, a Gumshoe Award, and is a three-time recipient of the Ellery Queen Readers Award for Best Short Story of the Year. His novel, The Bone Collector, was a feature release from Universal Pictures starring Denzel Washington in 1999. Uh, and then our last panelist, all the way to our end down here, is John Hart, who was born in Durham, North Carolina, and raised in Rowan County. Rowan County. Rowan <laughs> County. <laughs> Everybody gets it right. He earned uh, graduate degrees in accounting and law, and published his first novel, The King of Lies, to enormous critical acclaim in 2006, and it was followed in 2007 by Down River. Both novels <coughs> have been nominated for the Edgar Award uh, and the King of Lies won the Gumshoe Award and was nominated for the McCavity, Barry, and Anthony Awards. Thank you very much for joining us here tonight, all of you. My first question is for you, Margaret. Uh, what are some things that you've seen change in the mystery and crime fiction community in the past 25 years? Ah, uh, interesting question. And of course, when you say interesting question, that means give me time to think about this a minute. <laughs> um, things that have changed, for one thing, the great consolidation of publishing houses. Um, you just don't have the markets that you used to have, not the mainstream markets. Although, now I think the pendulum's starting to swing back, don't you think? Mm -hmm. And we're getting smaller niche houses that... Um, uh, the little independent publishers like uh, Poison Pen Press and uh, Five Star and there's just a whole bunch of them that were not out there when, when the big guys, the big New York guys were. So you're getting more regional publishing. Um, I think you're getting more people who really like and respect the mystery genre and, and enjoy writing in it. I don't know. You going to let Jeff answer that? Follow up to yeah. that, do you see any uh, trends in, in fiction, in cr mystery and crime <laughs> fiction, that have emerged recently, which really are interesting to you? Any recent trends in mystery and crime fiction? I'll, I'll do a slight tangent. I'll do a little, I'll, I'll pretend I'm a Washington politician and say <laughs> that's a good question. But um, I, I think, from uh, speaking from the um, perspective of somebody who has been in this business for a long time two people who are trying to get into this business, I'd say that um, looking at the au courant, the chic books, the ones that are selling now, um, the uh, Dan Brown type of book at the moment, um, that should not be what you are trying to emulate. You should write the kind of book that you truly enjoy reading. I um, was a, uh, my parents had a very interesting rule when I was growing up in the 1950s that I could read anything I could get my hands on, but I was not allowed to see certain movies, which was a little ironic in the 1950s because basically everything was, was at the worst PG-rated at the movie theater. 
but I could read Lady Chatterley's Lover, or I could read the Ian Fleming books and read all the dirty parts in them. But the irony Mickey was Spillane. that there were Mickey Spillane, exactly. And uh, but you know, at eight and nine and ten, I skipped over those parts. I wasn't interested. <laughs> I wanted to get to the action. But because those were books that I loved, those were the books that I started to write at a very young age. I wrote my first book when I was eleven. It was. Mm. It was, very, it was a short story, really, but I considered it a book because that's what moved me. And I didn't think, although I liked Lord of the Rings, too, I didn't think, you know, Tolkien is making more money than Ian Fleming, so I'm going to write a fantasy book. <laughs> I think you have to go with wh whatever you see, uh, the, the new things, uh, graphic novels, Margaret mentioned, very, very popular. I turned down an offer, a uh, fairly lucrative offer, to be involved in a graphic novel because it doesn't come, and they're very chic. The anime, the manga now, very chic, very popular. It doesn't come out of my experience. Anything you want to add, John? Or? No, no, well, a couple, a couple things. <laughs> um, never hand a, a microphone to an ex-attorney. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jeff, Jeff knows that. Um, okay, first of all, I'm, I'm really at the far end of this spectrum. As Stacy indicated, I've only had two novels out, which means that not very long ago, I would have been sitting out there where, where you guys are. Um, so there, there are two key notes of hope here. One, it, it's very doable to actually get published with perseverance, persistence, and all of those great words. Uh, and it's also great for me to see that there is life uh, after book two, and that, <laughs> that hopefully in, in some period of time I too can have 20, God knows how many novels <laughs> out there. Very encouraging, it's very encouraging. Um, I, I'm about a month away from finishing book three, and I, I'm already nervous about book four, and I don't think that ever ends really. But, but Jeff is absolutely right um, in two of the things that he said. You should never try to chase the trend because trends are very ephemeral and they come and go uh, before you can blink. And uh, I, I know from chats with my editor uh, and with my <coughs> agents that everybody in publishing has been deluged with the next Dan Brown. And it's all pitched that way. It's the next great religious historical thriller. Um, so so don't, don't try to chase that, that ghost. Um, and, and secondly, the, the bit about life experience is very, very true. Um, I, I wrote my first published novel when I was 35. That was The King of Lies. Granted, it didn't come out for about four or five years after that. That's, that's how long it took. Um, the two novels that I wrote before that I did in my 20s, and, and they had no business being published. And I'm thrilled to death that they <laughs> will never be seen by any of you <laughs> or anyone that, that I care about. Uh, and that's justice and, and appropriate. So. Um, th this is the right time to actually be, maybe not, I won't say that young people can't do it, but until I became uh, a criminal defense attorney and really brushed up against bad people doing bad things, that was the first time I became really qualified to, to write about this stuff. Mm. But uh, John, don't throw those out because um, <laughs> as soon as you strike it really big, your publisher is going to be saying, "We want your laundry list, we want your grocery <laughs> list, and those first two novels." Well, you didn't shred them, <laughs> did you? Uh, they, they've actually asked, in fact, begged to see them. Uh, my editor has asked on six occasions. I've sworn that I will never show them to him, and he promises he'll publish them under a pseudonym if need be. <laughs> uh, but but I had this discussion with the president of my house actually, and, and my feeling is they're under the impression, rightly or wrongly, that I can write. And I don't want to blow that up for anything. And the, the president of St. Martin's Press nodded sagely and said, <laughs> wise man, <laughs> wise man. I don't have any unpublished novels sitting in my file cabinets because I started off as a short story writer. I really did not think I could fill up 300 pages of manuscript. So, but I do have lots of short stories that will never see the daylight, except that each one of them had a little nugget of the truth in it, and I have cannibalized them ruthlessly. <laughs> and I think you do. You probably have, with with your books, taken incidents oh, yeah. and characters. No, I, no, those are too bad by far. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> one of the things that strikes me about all of your work is the strong sense of place in your novels. Mm -hmm. Why is a strong sense of place important to you? Well, it really is, and, and I didn't know that for a long time. My first books were actually set in New York because I thought that that is what the market demanded. So what Jeff has just said about writing the books that are dear to your heart, not that I did not enjoy writing the New York books. I did. I liked the character. My books tend to be more character driven, and so I like this character that I had for the New York books. But. I, I, I really wanted to write out of where I was, out of my current experiences. 
I live on a farm that's been in the family for over a hundred years now. So this, this piece of land is very dear to me. But I didn't think that anybody else would care about it. I didn't think I could set a book in Johnston County in the tobacco fields and cotton fields of Johnston County. But it turns out that I can, and that people in New York and California and Chicago think that that's as exotic as I think their lives are. So, <laughs> so you write out of your own experience that you cannot say that too much. I, um, <coughs> um, I, I approach a book from a plot first. I'm, I'm a very uh, tight plotter. I like uh, many plots and some plots all kind of woven together. But the best plot in the world uh, is useless if you don't have two other elements. One is characters of depth, both the good guys and the bad guys, and um, a sense of the uh, place. Now, um, I mentioned Washington politics. Well, just like them, we make up things for a living, you know. And um, when you do that, when you, you, you craft sometimes a fairly incredible story, I certainly am guilty of that, um, you need to ground that story in uh, as much reality as you can, and that means details. Um, so the place, as well as the characters, have, has, have to come alive. The places have to come alive so that you can smell them and see them. And that way you can get away with a lot more uh, of the, um, you know, rather um, punch the envelope, uh, push the envelope, um, plot twists and turns and the surprises and so forth, because people say, oh, well, now I know, okay, I can see this, I can feel it. But just get it right. Don't have people, as I did in one book, rafting down the Arkansas River in, in, in uh, the, the Midwest because um, at the deepest, it's apparently eight inches. So. <laughs> um, the, the faith of your reader is so paramount. Uh, once they accept you uh, as the voice, as the storyteller, uh, as long as you can keep them from finding a reason to reject you and, and kick themselves out of the story, then you're well on your way to, to achieving what you're setting out to do. Um, and place is certainly very important to that. For me, it, it was a little bit different perhaps, and again, I've only um, published two novels. Uh, I am blessed and cursed with coming from a place that I love and hate at the same time. Uh, that, that's Rowan County, that's Salisbury, North Carolina. Um, that's where both of my first published novels have been set. Um, and by love, hate, you know, picture any small town that any of you might have grown up in. It, it's got all of its baggage and all of its greatness. And so I, I set both of my books in my hometown knowing full well the dangers of it. First of all, that everyone believes they're in the book. Uh, they're angry that they're not in the book or they want to know who these really bad people are. In fact, I'll digress for a quick second and tell a story in, in The King of Lies. Uh, I have two particularly unsavory characters, and they're both women. And by unsavory, I mean um, money-grubbing, backstabbing, shallow, uh, self-serving, no respect for their husband or anything else. And when the book came out, I didn't go back across the county line for eight weeks. I was on tour, and I was scared. <laughs> and I needed time for my spies to report back to me whether or not it was safe. When I finally was given the green light to come back, I was accosted, and I don't choose that word lightly, I was accosted by about 15 people, all of whom, who's, they all said the same thing. First of all, we know who these two women are, and when I assured them that they really did not know who these women are because they were figments, uh, they, all, they all told me who they thought they were, and they all picked the same two women. <laughs> 15 people, 15 different instances, they all picked the same two women. And here's where truth and fiction get a little bit muddled, because so many people now have heard this circulated through town that these two women think I'm telling people that they're the two characters. And I know this because they won't speak to me. So that's the danger of setting uh, something in your hometown. For me, it was a question of uh, ease in that I can see the place very clearly. I love it. I hate it with great passions. Uh, I can convey those things very convincingly, I believe. And so um, it, it's easy to buy the faith of the reader in that area without too much work. And I always figured that I wasn't going to get published anyway, so how much harm can it do? And uh, I just thought I would change it if I ever got published, and then I forgot. And so it came out, and here I am. <laughs> book, book three, I'm moving to a completely fictionalized setting. Um, 
one because it's feeling a little down east and two because I'm, I'm tired of these conversations on Main Street in Salisbury. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm with Margaret. The, the small town southern setting does not have to be a detriment. In fact, I'm off next week to Denmark for five days. My Danish publisher is bringing me over to release Down River. Apparently, the Danes have kind of a national obsession with the American South. It's a real big deal over there. And so I'm being brought over as this southern guy. Uh, and, and New York publishers have not decided that it's only regional books if they're set in the South. And that, that was a risk, I think, but it hasn't struck me yet. So. Mm -hmm. But one thing about talking about setting is I, I wish I could remember which science fiction author it was that I read one, one good piece of advice, which I've always tried to take, and I would pass it on to you. If you really want to ground your book in the setting, on every page, if you can, do it subtly. Make some reference to things that you do not see. I mean, get in the other four senses, not just the sight, but the smell and the taste and the feel. I mean, who could live in North Carolina this last week and not be thoroughly irritated with all the pine pollen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's on everything. It gets on your fingertips. It um, Just let it go. Um, so you put the pine pollen in, not just the azaleas, but also the, the, the jasmine that smells the, and what you hear, the crickets, the bird song. All of this goes to ground yourself and your characters in the place that they find themselves. Staying with the creative process, Margaret, your two series protagonists seem very different emotionally. Mm -hmm. Secret Herald is, is more of a loner. Uh, she is only connected to the people uh, around her when it's through her work. Uh, Judge Deborah Knott is, is very different from that. Mm -hmm. She's very confident and she has a strong circle of friends around her. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the creative process in getting into the minds of those two very different characters. Mm. Yeah, I've had a lot of people tell me that it's almost as if I'm schizophrenic and this, <laughs> this, these books are written by two different people. And I think that's because with the Sigrid Harrell character, who fascinates me frankly more than the Deborah Knott character does, um, I, I almost, I, I have this image, if you've ever watched a butterfly emerge from a chrysalis, and if it's interrupted before its wings are fully pumped up, it never really flies, or it doesn't soar. And that was the, the feeling that I was trying to get with the Deborah Knott character. And frankly, uh, I mean with the Sigrid Harrell character, um, almost this cramped feeling within herself that sh that she can't open up to other people. But with the Deborah Knott character, she was totally created to be an antithesis to the Sigrid Harrell character. So where Sigrid is a loner, Deborah's got this claustrophobic family. Um, <laughs> where Sigrid is big city, art, Deborah's down home country farm. Um, one is just really done to, to be the antithesis of the other. And as I say, when I write about Sigrid, it's almost as if I'm, I'm cramping my spirit inside of hers. But when I write Deborah, it's like I've had three drinks in the governor's office. <laughs> <laughs> in keeping with the topic of uh, the creative process and character, uh, how much of a challenge is it to you, Jeff, to get inside the mind of a quadriplegic? Mm -hmm. Well, this. Um, uh, is one of the best parts of writing, the absolute best parts. Um, I, uh, I work hard. I work eight hours a day doing this uh, and have for the last uh, 25 years or so as, as a full-time novelist. Um, I've been full-time for about 20 years. Um, and most of that is muscle and sweat. That's all it is. I gotta get my characters up in the morning. They have to walk, they have to brush their teeth, walk outside, get into trouble. I have to get them out of trouble, try not to get killed. If I don't like them, sometimes they do get killed. <laughs> but, um, and that's the craft of, of writing. If I was born with anything that I'm very, very lucky about, it's, um, I guess I call it a tendency toward voyeurism, a curiosity, a fascination with people. When I'm on tour in, in Europe, some of the older countries in Europe, um, my uh, publicists will say, oh, Jeff, we have to go look at the, uh, the bones of this saint, or we have to go look at this cathedral. <laughs> And you know, you've seen one bone of a saint, you pretty much have seen them all. I want to sit out in the cafe and just watch people and overhear conversations. And that is something that is just, I've done all my life. 
And it's by absorbing things like that that I can step into the minds of, um, of the characters. And it is a skill that I think can be developed. I happen to enjoy doing it. But you really, you really have to. I write from shifting points of view, um, from the uh, always third person shifting points of view, from uh, in the case of uh, the, uh, my book, The Twelfth Card, a uh, 16 year old African American girl, in the case of the Stone Monkey, Asian Americans, um, you just have to you just have to do it, and it's one of the most exciting things about writing mm -hmm. because it gives me the chance to learn about these people. Uh, Lincoln Rhyme, a, a quadriplegic, I had to get into his mind because he is basically all mind, and see what it would be like to be someone like that. And it's a uh, it certainly is a challenge, but it it uh, you know you, you do this business because it's fun for us too, and that's one of the things I find the most enjoyable. Switching gears a little bit, uh, it seems like to me, John, one thread that I see between uh, King of Lies and Downriver uh, is certainly setting. The, the two novels are set in the same place. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the decision-making process that you went through in deciding to write standalones when so many mystery and crime authors build their careers with, with series books? <laughs> Thank you. I'm a, I'm a pretty pragmatic-minded writer, um, and I, I could look out uh, at the field of um, crime fiction, mystery fiction, thriller fiction, uh, and see how many really great writers there are that have these beloved series. Uh, and you all know who they are. I mean, they're, they're up here with me and uh, elsewhere. <laughs> and I, I felt first and foremost that I was running um, the, the very real risk of coming off uh, as third best in a very successfully crowded field. So there was that little part of me that was somewhat um, you know, sharp-eyed towards the business side of things, but that was only the very small part of it. Uh, one thing that we all seem to have in common is a great love of writing character, and, and for me, uh, I'm very much into my characters, and I have not found one that I'm ready to live with for a long time yet. I, I'm really, I'm enjoying kicking the tires and seeing who's out there. And um, you know what? I, I'm I'm very different from Jeff, and Jeff has not spoken about this, but I, I think I've read this about you or heard this about the, this about you that you you outline very carefully. And I believe that novelists often fall into two camps: those that outline. And those like myself that adhere to the school of grope and hope. Um, <laughs> my suspicion is that the outliners are much smarter uh, than, than those that write as I do. I start out with very, very little and a lot of faith in myself and in the power of a year's work and in um, you know, those that are around me. And, and for instance, with both The King of Lies and Down River, I started out with really this, a strong sense of the character what he looked like, and, and by the way, these are both first-person narratives. Uh, I'm doing something different now for a very good reason, but uh, I started out with a very strong sense of what these people looked like, although I very rarely describe my characters, I'll, I'll, the main protagonists. I like the readers to fill in the blanks. But more importantly, I have a sense of perhaps two very strong emotional issues that drive the character, and I have a very strong sense of an opening scene, and that's it. Maybe some idea of where I'll be at, towards the end of the book, but vague at best. Uh, with Work Pickens and the King of Lies, I knew that he was driven by extreme feelings of guilt and shame, and that he would have to find some way to, to resolve these feelings as he sort of spun around the plot elements that drove the story. And I wanted him to come to grips with those feelings by the time he arrived at the end. With Adam Chase and Down River, all I knew was that this guy was angry and that he felt a great, great sense of loss. I didn't know what he was angry about when I wrote the first scene. I didn't know what he'd lost. So for me, it's a great year-long adventure to kind of walk this path and see what all the, the buttons are for these characters. Um, but because I do fear the risk of books and characters starting to feel similar, uh, especially as having written two books from the first-person perspective of, of an adult white male, I was very concerned that the books might start to feel similar, so I forced myself with the, the book I'm currently <coughs> writing to break out of that mold, shift to multiple uh, point of view, which I'd never done, which scared me a lot, and I made my protagonist a 13-year-old boy whose twin sister a year earlier had been abducted, and so the, the issue is what has this traumatic event done to this boy who is now basically traumatized beyond belief. I mean, his family's falling apart, the community doesn't know what to do with him. 
that has been very, very difficult for me, and, and I do re require a lot of imagination and some voyeurism, as, as Jeff said, but you know, I don't see a lot of traumatized 13-year-old boys in my life, and I don't know about you guys, but I can't remember that far back. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough road, and I think everybody does it differently. And I, the only thing I would encourage you as writers is just to keep faith in, in your own abilities and, and what the power of time and hard work can bring to you at the end of the, the stack of pages, however many they may be. Yeah, I would, I, I would just like to underline that. The main thing is to finish the book. I mean, just, I, I've gone to so many conferences, and I'm sure you have too, Jeff, in which someone will come up with just a wonderful first two chapters, and you'll think, oh, I can't wait to read the rest of this book. And you come back two years later, and that same person is there, and you say, um, what about that wonderful book? Oh, I, well, I got tired of that. Now I'm starting on something else. I've got three chapters on this new book. <laughs> no, finish the book. Even if it's terrible, finish it because you will learn so much in the doing of it. And and just f most agents, I mean, we, we haven't talked much about the business end of this yet, but most agents and, and editors don't want to talk to you if you have not got a finished book. I don't care how good the premise is. Mm. And, and Jeff, what would you say <laughs> if, if, you know, if I found out tomorrow that my first mystery crime fiction novel was going to be published with a major publisher? And I asked you, you know, I'm thinking about writing a series with this, but I don't know whether that's the way to go or whether to go the way that John has, has mm -hmm. gone, gone with standalones. What would you say to somebody who asked that? Well, I have actually I've made a uh, conscious decision. My uh, career up until about uh, two years ago was to do a Lincoln Rhyme novel, series novel, and then a standalone. And um, my uh, standalones, I, it, it turned out were very similar to the Lincoln Rhyme books, mm -hmm. uh, books like um, The Blue Nowhere um, or A Garden of Beasts, in that they were very tightly plotted stories. I mean, very clockwork, very intricate, um, and hence the outlining, and I will just make a fast comment on that. I have to outline, A, I'm not very smart, B, that I have so many balls in the air at once, if I didn't, I would drop one of them, and we cannot do that. But so I was doing the Lincoln Rhyme books and this, the the one-offs, as they're called, and um, I started. And I always listen to my email. I listen to all, read all my email, and I may very well have emailed some of uh, some of you here. And uh, I would I get comments like, uh, "Well, we we love the plots, but we love we love your characters. We'd like to know a little bit more about your characters." So I made the conscious decision to. Um, create a, a new series, and that's the woman named Catherine Dance, who is, um, she's a kinesics expert. And if you've read The Cold Moon or The Sleeping Doll, you, uh, you're familiar with her. And um, I, uh, I thought, well, maybe I'll try a one-off with her and uh, be much more character-driven. Of course, I have to have my twist and surprise at the end. It's not gonna be a diva book without that big twist, then another twist, and then yet another twist, if I can work that out. But, but essentially, there's, there's no forensic work in the books, there's no CSI, looking through microscopes. It's just her talking with people, and we know about her and her family and her children. And um, the, uh, the, the response has been good. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, um, not a Da Vinci Code by any means, but, but the people seem to enjoy this character-driven book. Well, it was gonna be a one-off, be more character driven, but now I'm thinking, you know what? Uh, she could come she's back. She's going to come back. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell a very fast story. I don't want to monopolize the time here. This is maybe apocryphal because Larry Block told it. So I don't know whether it's true or not, but great writer, Lawrence Block. But he said, um, Yeah, I heard about this uh, young writer one time. And he'd written a couple books, and uh, uh, the, the, the most recent one that he published was. Uh, it had a good protagonist, private eye of some kind, but, but the villain was a top-notch villain, sort of a Hannibal Lecter kind of villain. And in the final scene, the hero prevailed against the villain, and it was set in Manhattan. He shot the villain in the head, and he fell in a storm drain and was washed out to sea via the, uh, by the Hudson River. And the book came out. The reviews were, you know, very good reviews, and the 99% of the reviewers commented on the, the wonderful villainry of this bad guy. The publisher calls him up, says, you know, Joe, we like the book, but we really like the villain. Shot in the head, washed out to sea. Third book comes out, who does it feature? 
but no one's back again. How did he handle that? Second paragraph, miraculously, he survived. <laughs> That's like Joan Hess. Do you yeah. know Joan? Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Joan decided that she would sit. She writes the Maggoty series. She decided that she would sit down one day when she was about six books into her series, and do what we call a Bible, so that she mm. would know all the characters. And to her intense surprise, a character that died in the first book was alive and well four <laughs> books later, <laughs> and nothing was ever said about right. how she got there. Shifted gears a little bit towards the business end of things. Uh, what would you say is, is the number one thing that aspiring writers probably don't know about how a major publisher works that we need to know? Oh, probably just how much of it you have to do yourself these days. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that Sisters in Crime was formed was because we felt like the men were getting all the publicity <laughs> and promotion money. Certainly they were getting most of the reviews, uh, the New York Times, the year that we first monitored it, um, women were writing something like 47% of the books and they were getting 16% of the reviews. If your book doesn't get reviewed, it's hard for people to know that you're out there. And I can very much remember when we published our first how-to booklet on, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, Shameless Promotion for Brazen Hussies. Good book. Good book. Very good book. One of my male writer friends was really annoyed about that book. He said, um, you, sh you shouldn't have done it. And I said, why not? Because women need this help. He said, yeah, but if the publishers find out that women can do it, they're going to make us do it too. <laughs> and duh, yeah. So, so you have to be prepared to do, to travel, to promote, to contact book reviewers. Um, all the stuff that you didn't used to have to do. And, and the p editors at your publishing house, they're pushed too. I mean, they are, they don't have the staff, they don't have the luxury, they're not the Maxwell Perkinses, are not out there. You pretty much have to turn in a pretty much completed book. I mean, you will get some editorial feedback, but nothing like it used to be. So a lot of people are going into um, freelance editors, and have a freelance editor look at your book first. I, I don't know if that's a good idea or not. How do you feel about it? Um, yeah, I actually hire, uh, I have a, uh, an assistant who uh, works for me, and then I also hire two copy editors uh, at my own expense uh, prior to my sending the book to the publisher for the first time. And that's a, that's a full copy edit. It's expensive, but um, for one thing, I, I I'm a kind of a sloppy typist, so I do make typos, and I, I get I write very very quickly. Uh, my my first draft is always very long and very sloppy, um, and I edit I rewrite thirty or forty times. Mm -hmm. Then it goes to the copy editors. Meanwhile, I'm reading it again, and my assistant is reading it. And um, my typical editorial letter. Well, when I first started out in this business, my typical editorial letter was thanks, but no thanks. But after that, it was uh, page after page of line edits, and you get back the manuscript that was all marked up. Doesn't happen now. Just doesn't happen now. And again, one if I could, could leave you with any message, remember, people pay a lot of money and spend a lot of time for your work as a writer. You owe it to them to give them the best book you possibly can. And if that means you don't want to read it one more time, you have to read it one more time. Mm. Are we taking, can we do a question here? Or? Well, well, I'd like to get oh. through the. Okay. The well, we'll, 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 we'll get, get you. Yeah. Uh, this, this is a great question, and I'm, I'm really glad to have the chance to speak to this because this is something I feel pretty strongly about, having been uh, so new in the business for just a short time now. I was under the impression, as I think a lot of people are, that, that published is published is published. Okay, and that's not the way it works. Um, for a book to succeed, you really have to begin with enthusiasm of the house, okay? And it's a grassroots thing from your editor to your editor's assistant and on up through the house. And uh, if the house is not fired up about your work, the, the odds of achieving any kind of breakout success are fairly slim. So my, my advice to you when you reach the level of being involved with one of these publishers is this. Remember that it's not just the book, although that's where it begins. I mean, the book has to be a good book or the enthusiasm will never uh, arise. But I think it's really important to remember that the house is not 
timber and nails and shingles. These are people, and you have to treat them like people. I, I see, in, in my short time, I have seen ego-driven, self-important writers shoot themselves in the foot with a house that really wants to build them, but they get so tired of prima donna behavior and, and selfish demands that they eventually just throw up their hands and say, it's a good book, but it's not a great book, and we don't have to put up with this. Uh, so I would encourage any of you that are lucky enough to, to get in with the house to remember to be nice and respectful and understand that these are professionals too who are trying to do their job to make you famous. And if you ever get to the point uh, where Jeff is, uh, you know, then you can maybe afford to be, be rude. I'm not suggesting that he is. Uh, I, mean, I, I would love to get to the point where I can afford to be an insufferable jerk. Uh, not that I would ever choose to be so, but just to have that comfort level. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm all about building my career, and I need these people to do it. And so uh, I'm not suggesting anything, uh, you know, false or untoward, but these, these are people, and people like helping people that are nice. It, it's really as simple as that. It's a business. It's no different than anything else. It's a manufacturing business. Our product is creativity. Um, but um, whether you're in the service field or you're um, selling something or you're in a restaurant, it doesn't make any difference. We write books. We, we interact with our fans and with our publishing company and all the, um, the many people in the media that we deal with as professionals. And you can't go wrong with them. Good work. Uh, just to communicate effectively up here, I've got about four or five more prepared questions and then we'll open it up to you guys uh, for questions from the audience. I do again want to emphasize that I want to make sure that everybody here has the opportunity to ask a question. We'll seat belt these folks in so they can't leave and you can ask all of your questions. Uh, and again, we are going to go out to eat afterwards over at, at TK Trips if you'd like to join us over there for a more informal uh, kind of Q&A session. You're, you're more than welcome to do that. In fact, I'd encourage you to. Uh, my next question is for Jeff, uh, and any of you can take this as well, but I, I'm interested in where you would say that suspense comes from inside of you. Is it something that you had to learn, or is it hardwired into your DNA? I, uh, I largely learned it. It's, uh, again, this is a, a set of skills, and I learned it by um, uh, exposing myself to a great deal of uh, reading, uh, murder mysteries and, and thrillers, reading thrillers from a very young age. And the distinction I make there is it's a bit artificial and doesn't always hold true, but a, a murder mystery tends to ask the question, what happened? You know, what, how do we figure out who the, the bad guy is? A thriller tends to ask the question, what's going to happen? What there is uh, an impending threat of some sort, and we uh, we look at that. I found that I was most excited by the concept of what is going to happen. Um, keep the pages turning as often as possible. My my, if I have a literary philosopher, it's Mickey Spillane, who you mentioned earlier, and he said this: people don't read books to get to the middle. <laughs> they read books to get to the end, and it's our responsibility to uh, keep that uh, level of suspense going uh, in the sort of stuff I write uh, every couple pages, if not every paragraph. What is going to happen next? What is going to happen? And that just felt natural to me because it's what I enjoyed reading. And um, I, I think of the... Um, uh, when I'm, I'm teaching my courses, I tell my, my students this, you keep, that, you keep that tension, you keep that conflict going on every single page. And how do you do that? I'm gonna tell you the best way to do it right now. Get your pens out, get your paper out, you ready to go? Here's how you do it. <laughs> Unresolved anticipation. And I hit on that pretty early. And I realized you, you tell them they're gonna tell them something, and then you don't tell them. But you have to ultimately, because you don't want to frustrate them. But, um, and that was a, 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 just a, a rule that I, I developed probably into my fourth or fifth or sixth book. Um, and I, 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 my, my early books, my first, uh, you know, as I said, the first four or five or six, I gave a lot of stuff away. I was not really conscious of it. And I went back and re-outlined them and saw what I'd done wrong. I'd given away the suspense. I'd anticipated what was going to happen. 
And so um, I look, I jotted down notes. And in fact, when I, um, as we were talking earlier, when your publisher does want you to come back and those books that have gone out of print, they want to publish them. I said, well, okay, but I'm going to rewrite them. So I rewrote my first six books before, and the ones you can buy now are, um, uh, are the revised versions, which I say in the, the, the foreword. Although ironically, the early ones are the ones that are expensive now on eBay and in book collectors because they were bad and the, um, the print runs were so small. Uh, how many people here have read Down River or King of Lies? All right, you're going to be buying some books tonight, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, another one of the things that I'm struck with in, in both of your books is the role of the family and family turmoil in, in both of the stories. Uh, why is that important to you, John? <coughs> well, for, for those of you that haven't read the books, you probably can't appreciate the scope of what he's referring to. Um, I, I mean, I, I seem to wallow in family dysfunction in my books, um, you know, to the chagrin, uh, ultimately, of my parents. And, and in fact, my father, this poor man, um, there are a lot of father-son issues in these books. And, uh, you know, I, I assure everyone that I love my father. In fact, I had to say as much in the acknowledgments of Down River because um, he's, he's retired out in Tucson, and all of his friends want to know what the heck did you do? Why does this kid hate you so much? Uh, you know, for me, it's it's um, it, it's really that I think family. Well, I won't say family squabbles, family bitterness, family betrayals, um, family dysfunction makes for very rich literary soil in that you know, we all have them to some degree or another, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent. I found that people that come from dysfunctional families that read my books can say to themselves, God, I, I know what that feels like, and they feel it more strongly. And people that come from wonderful families can look at my stories and say, that, that poor bastard, um, and they feel it more strongly. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I'll continue to mind that, but I, I just think that the hurts are a little deeper and the memories a little longer and betrayals are, are more cutting. Um, I come from a large family. I, I actually do love my family, but I think family is like place. If you can do it well and convincingly, then your, your readers will feel even more deeply enmeshed in, in the world that you've built. Um, and, and sort of backtracking for a second, because it's kind of tied in uh, to, to Jeff's earlier comments about uh, tension and, and suspense. I, I believe at the root for me of what I try to do is this firm conviction that your reader has to care passionately about your characters. And if they care about your characters, meaning they can see them, they can feel them, taste them, uh, then simple matters of putting that one or two characters in peril, whether it's jail or freedom or uh, life or death, you can buy the same kind of emotional tension you might get uh, with the Dan Brown book and the tick ticking bomb in the Vatican. Uh, I, I like writing stories that are grounded in very real emotional reactions and, and I tend to end up with very pain racked characters. Uh, I, I'm moving away from that because I, I don't want my wife to think that I'm really troubled. You know? <laughs> um, but, but so far, um, she's, she's still with me and my parents haven't disowned me. Um, but I, I just enjoy it. I mean, it's all part of being in the South and being Southern and I seem to find that my, my books are becoming more and more uh, wrapped up in what I think it's like to be a Southerner. Um, so I don't know if that's responsive or not. That's an amazing answer. On the topic of race, Margaret, how difficult is it for you to represent black characters fairly and accurately? Mm. I think it's very important to try to do so. Um, I, I, I've never been accused of, I, let me back up. My first books, set of books, were written third person. The Deborah Knott books are written first person. So therefore, because they're first person, when she looks at race, she speaks very directly to the reader as to, to what it means. And I have examined, uh, I did do two books on, because that's the thing that keeps coming up is, as Senator Obama has reminded us very forcefully. And, and there's so many things, so many hurts within the community, within the black community, that the white community is totally oblivious to and don't know about. And every time people start saying, white people start saying, um, you know, get over it. You don't get over something like that. I'm, the, the book that I'm working on now is set in Wilmington. 
And it's amazing how many white people know absolutely nothing about the riots that went on in Wilmington in 1898. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get on a huge political platform. I think anybody who reads my books know where my political leanings are, and I've been chastised for saying ugly things about Ronald Reagan. Um, <laughs> look, just because I don't think he should be on the dime or on Mount Rushmore does not mean that he didn't have some good things, but we won't go there. But um, I keep thinking about how um, the Reverend Wright must have been a young man in 1970 when the Tuskegee experiments were announced to the nation. And, and that had to be a big problem. And this is something that a lot of white people are not even aware of about what was done to the, the blacks that were experimented on. Um, but I, I, I write sometimes from a male viewpoint. I write from women's viewpoints. I write from black. I write from Asian. Um, I, I just feel like Walt Whitman, who said, I am large. I include multitudes. And I don't see, I mean, we're all human and we're all trying to do the best we can. And I have had some people, I, I had one copy <coughs> editor, it was rather amusing in one of my books. He, um, he said, why do you find it necessary to say the white defendant? You, you mentioned her blonde hair and blue eyes. Why do you have to say that she's white? He never said one single word about any of the other characters that were identified as being black or being Asian or being male or female, but as soon as you start putting the white tag in, and that's because I don't want the default character to always be white. I, I, don't, I don't like that. And so I throw in the white doctor or the white uh, drunk that comes before Deborah because I, I just feel like that's, we're all made up of different peoples. And Jeff, how would you answer that? Well, I, uh, I, I feel first, first and foremost, I am a uh, an entertainer, and uh, I want to tell a good story. That, that's that's we start with that. But uh, as with creating uh, fleshed out characters, if there are not political and social issues you look at, your books are not going to have as much emotional resonance. Um, and that's what this is all about. How did how do you get to the end? As Mickey Spillane said, well, you you create these layers of. Uh, of uh, jeopardy and depth um, and issues that the characters have to deal with. And uh, race is certainly one. In, in America, we cannot look at American society and not talk about race at some point. Uh, but by the same token, and that was uh, dealt with specifically in my book, The, uh, the Twelfth Card, uh, in which actually events from Reconstruction um, uh, had, I, I, I got uh, lots of twists, I don't want to give too much away, but had consequences in uh, 2006 or 2005, whenever that book was, uh, was uh, published. Um, the um, other issues I deal with, um, they can't intrude. Ernest Hemingway said, if you want to send a message, go to Western Union. It's not a novelist's job to try to convert somebody, but it is a novelist's job to give that resonance and, and depth. Uh, I talk about the war in Iraq and the cold moon to some extent, and it's not a uh, it, it's a fairly balanced view. In my book, Garden of Beasts, set in Berlin in 1936, uh, when Hitler was uh, in power and consolidating more power, there were um, good Nazis and bad Nazis. There were Jews who betrayed their fellow, uh, fellow Jews. There were Christians who betrayed their fellow Christians and Jews, and Nazis who protected Christians. I tried to be balanced uh, about that, and I think it... Uh, it, it's, it's that kind of uh, realistic uh, embodying within the book that uh, can give it wings. You want to keep going on this? Or? Sure. Okay. Uh, it hasn't really been an issue for me. I'm two books in. Um, I haven't broken out yet of my adult white male protagonist. I haven't tried to slip into a minority skin or a woman's skin. What I have experienced is that if somebody wants to find something to bitch about in one of your books, they're going to find it. Um, I get a lot with women. I've, I've been asked several times, why do I write such horrible women? Um, maybe I set the tone with those two I described you earlier. You know, but people always ask, why, why do you write um, you know, downtrodden women or abused women or broken women? Um, and, and why are they such bad people? And, and what all the people that have asked that question have failed to notice is that 
if you look to the next level in my books, what you see is that it was the actions of the man or the men in their lives that led them to whatever this bad act or, or bad attitude may have been. But the people that come to me and complain about it, they, they never take that next step and look. Um, and I think that if I move to the point where I'm including a lot of uh, racial issues in my books, I'm sure I'll get the same thing. And you need to be several things as a writer, um, and I, the list would go on forever, but one of those I think you need to be an honest observer of what you see, and you need to be fearless in, in your choices. You can't worry about censoring your perceptions for fear that you're going to upset uh, someone with the race card or with the sex card. Um, and you just need to prepare yourself for fallback and fallout, because it's going to happen. Uh, I mean, I, I've, I've had emails from angry uh, evangelical ministers that think they've found Satanism in the King of Lies. <laughs> I've had 3,000 emails about the King of Lies. Not one of them thought that there were satanic undertones in the book. And you would be appalled if I really gave you the breakdown of why he thought it was there. But he had this whole litany of twisted logic that led to it. And uh, at the end of the day, there was one scene that I explained very simply that he had misinterpreted. And he, he literally said, oh, um, I take it back. Now, this man had led his congregation to the Rowan County Public Library, where I wrote the book, who had 25 copies on the shelves. And his, he demanded that they take it off the shelves. And, you know, th it's this kind of reactionism that I, I refuse to, to worry about because there's always going to be someone that's unhappy. With that said, I don't have a body of work that I need to worry about or defend in terms of any kind of trends or themes that I seem to touch upon. Uh, and maybe that'll be an issue for me at some point. But right now, all I care about is writing a character or characters with credible, convincing motives whether they're the bad guys, the good guys, or whatever, they need to be grounded in the real and they need to feel real. And, you know, sure, I, I will avoid using stereotypes, whether it's the redneck stereotype or the, the race stereotype or anything, but at the end of the day, as, as Jeff has said, I want to tell a story, and the story has to be compelling. And to be compelling, you have to be somewhat fearless in your writing. And someone once said, and I love this, if you're not slightly frightened or embarrassed by the words that you're writing, you're not pushing the edge hard enough, and you're going to end up with boring writing. And so I, I often catch myself at the end of a, an hour or a day's work asking, was that a bunch of safe writing, or am I, am I pushing the envelope a little bit? Uh, and you just need to prepare for that, because people will find messages, and they will try to call you on it, whether it's legitimate or not. Can I use that Satanism thing? I like the publicity yeah. of trying to pull my book out of the library. Yeah. <laughs> But what they both have said, I think, just to recapitulate, is you write as honestly as you can. And that means nobody's wholly good, nobody's wholly bad. You've got to mix the light and the dark together. I mean, no, no, no bad villain ever gets up in the morning and says, I think I'm going to do evil today. I'm going to stomp all over people and I'm going <laughs> to pull out their fingernails and I'm going to you know, violate their civil rights. They get up thinking that they are doing what's right and and you just have to give them that dignity of their beliefs hmm. well kind of segueing into my very last question then and then we'll open it up to you guys uh, for your questions as well uh, Jeff let's start with you how important is it or on the subject of character motivation uh, how do you go about developing uh, a villain character's motives um, the um, I love my bad guys a lot. Um, in fact, I tend not to kill them off. There's a there's a wing in the jail in Manhattan that has all of the deeper villains. Cause, and someday there's going to be a jail break, and they're going to get out. Um, the 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 thing to remember is uh, I use the, the the example of a uh, and you don't really have bad made for TV movies anymore. From my era in the 60s and 70s, we had there was cinema, Arthur Penn kind of Bonnie and Clyde cinema, and then you know Butch Cassidy, and then there was the Sunday night movie event that was invariably very bad. Now we have HBO and Showtime and some really really good things. But I look back to the villains of those bad made for TV films, and if it was the overarching villain, you know the the, the man behind everything. He was head of a drug company or an oil company. You didn't have to say anything more. Just by definition, he was evil. If he was the, the thug, he had my hairstyle, 
but a ponytail <laughs> and a black leather jacket. And we knew right then that was the villain. Well, that where's the emotional engagement in that? I want my villain to, um, to have motives that we don't necessarily want him to fulfill because we, we, we want our hero to prevail and the victims to survive, but we, he has to feel, or she has to feel, um, a sense of, um, I am striving to achieve my goal, which may be if it's a hitman to, to kill or if it's a thief or having a caper book to steal. We, um, we want them to prevail. Now, not only do they have to, because we have an emotional engagement in this character, they become real then. If, if we care that they succeed, um, so that's important. But not only is, is that important to create a real living, breathing, bad, bad villain character, but if our hero prevails against a cardboard caricature, we think less of our hero. So I make all of my villains uh, certainly as smart as my heroes. I make them uh, as resourceful, if not more resourceful than my heroes. And they have the added advantage of, oh, these little things like laws and society's rules. Well, they don't have to pay any attention to those. So the more formidable you make your villain, the better off. But they still need, um, uh, th they still need human attributes. And just as a practical matter, Give him little quirks. Give him little quirks. I made a villain in a book of mine a few years ago. He whistled. Now whistling, I can't whistle, but whistling apparently is a big deal, and there are competitions of melodic whistlers, and orchestras bring in a whistler. And I thought, I, he needs to have a real, yeah, he needs to have some real aspects of him, so I made him a, a whistler. And uh, they, were, they had nothing to do with the plot, it was just an aspect of his uh, character. Little things like that, give them a backstory, uh, don't, you know, don't make them abused. As, well, they can certainly have childhood issues, but that we've had the cliche of why Hannibal Lecter became who he was. Are you familiar with the Hannibal Lecter story? Silence of the Lambs, one of the best thrillers ever written. Absolutely loved it. And the chilling line when uh, he is talking to uh, Clarice Starling, Hannibal Lecter talking to Clarice Starling, don't try to figure me out. Nobody can. There's no reason why I'm the way I am which to me is utterly terrifying. And then Harris, who is Thomas Harris, who is one of my favorite writers in a subsequent book, gave some clues as to why Hannibal Lecter was the way he was. And they seemed to me, frankly, to be a bit obvious and detracted from who Lecter was. Um, avoid those kind of, if I may use the word again, the phrase, made for TV, uh, groundings for why the character is motivated to do this or that. But, um, but, but give them a real sense of, uh, of being a human being. Okay, we're gonna take about a two minute break and then answer your questions. What I wanna do is kind of break the ice a little bit so if everybody would stand up and stretch a little bit or an hour into this. If I stand and up, I'm not gonna get back into this again. They're not staying where I am.